I'm Bob Hammond, Stake Young Men's President, and I think most of you know me, but uh, I would like to introduce our speakers tonight. Our speakers are Lee Adams and Mark Madsen. Lee, I think probably most of you do know, Lee was the past co-chair of the tutoring program at Stanford, and I think some of you have been part of that program. Uh, he's worked hard at it, and uh, he's, uh, I don't know, that you're, are you graduating this? Uh... I've got a couple of years left. Okay. <laughs> He's a graduate student in civil engineering, at, uh, which is dear to my heart, at uh, Stanford. And uh, I think most of you also know Mark Madsen. Mark is uh, a basketball player for Stanford. He's graduated or is going to graduate. Working on it. Working on it. Um, we have, uh, so we have two speakers from, from, the Stanford, uh, from the Stanford Ward. And following Elder Madsen's comments, President Smith would like to close and refreshments are at the conclusion of our fireside. Thanks. Well, there's a scripture um, in the Doctrine and Covenants that says, if, you, if, you are pre if thou art prepared, thou shalt not fear. Has anybody ever read that? Heard it? Um, I am I'm excited for the chance to... Uh, talk to some uh, of the young men and their fathers in the stake. Uh, I prepared for this. I um, wrote some notes and I left them at home. So <laughs> as one who doesn't speak uh, off the cuff too often, I hope you will have a prayer in your hearts uh, as I uh, speak a little bit uh, without notes uh, today. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an awesome experience to be involved with the priesthood. I was, uh, I was talking to somebody recently about uh, the home teaching program, which sometimes seems like uh, a chore that we do. But some of the, some of the richest um, associations that I've had have been through my own brothers uh, in, in the priesthood through the home teaching program. And the same thing goes with the Aaronic priesthood. Some of my best friends in life who are married and in elsewhere. I've known through, through the Aaronic Priesthood. We were members of a quorum, members of a teacher's quorum, of a priest quorum, or a deacon's quorum. And those have been some of the most uh, cherished uh, associations I have in my life. They say, um, I don't know if this is true, but they say uh, uh, women seem to change friends uh, very quickly sometimes. And, and I'm privileged to have a lot of my old friends uh, from the time I was in second and third grade and from the time I was a deacon and a teacher and a priest, and we still keep in touch. Um, now, and we're all at different stages in life. Uh, some of my friends are uh, married and have uh, several kids. I think the, the record is three. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to grad school. I'm not married uh, yet. So we're at different stages in life. And so I thought a little bit about, you know, what is it about uh, becoming a man? And we've talked about this um, with... Uh, with other friends as well, is uh, we see some of our younger brothers and young friends uh, going through that process as, as we've gone through it. And, and what is involved in, in becoming a man? Well, um, I, uh, before I, I go uh, into that uh, too much, I want to talk about some, some of the, uh, my experiences uh, I've had in life. And, um, one of the greatest ones was to work with my brother, who was four years younger than me, and we worked in the, in the Forest Service. And we worked up in the mountains of, of Idaho for a summer, and that started off uh, three summers where I worked uh, as, as a firefighter. Now, when I, was, when I was young, people would ask me, now, Lee, what do you want, what do you want to be uh, when you grow up? And, you know, deep down, I always wanted to be a firefighter. I just never wanted to, that was one of the things you didn't, um, it, just, it seemed like the wrong answer, to, you know, I was supposed to, um, but I wanted to be a firefighter, so I did. So I did, by the time I was, I was off my mission, I decided I wanted to go and, and uh, work for the Forest Service and fight forest fires. Now, this is, a, this is not a, a very um, fun job at times, it's very dirty, okay, you, you, go, you work for hours on end, it's very hot, um, sometimes during 90 degrees, 100 degree weather, and... Uh, and you wear, you know, long sleeve shirts and long sleeve pants that, that won't burn. And uh, it's just an incredibly uh, uh, dirty, dirty job. And um, I've learned a lot about it. I actually brought a prop today I want to use. I didn't know if 
this was legal to bring in the church, so I didn't uh, ask permission. Who has seen one of these before? Okay, some of the people in the, the tutoring program, the Menlo Park Second Branch, have seen this before because I've used it as, as an optic before. Um, anybody know what this is called? It's a pick. It's a Pulaski. Who said that? Zoe knows that this is a, this is a Pulaski. This is going to be, this, when you're a, a firefighter, is your best friend. Okay, now you've heard, heard of uh, some of the great fires that they've had maybe in, in the East Bay and in, in Yellowstone, mm -hmm. in Idaho, uh, maybe you've seen it. And they use airplanes and they drop retardant and, and they use helicopters that drop water. But the bulk of the work is done by men and women sometimes with Pulaski's. Okay, and it's a, it's a dirty job. You have to, um, you, you, like I've, I've had a shift once that I worked for 48 hours straight. And um, you get to be really good friends with your, with your Pulaski. Now, and, and this is, what you're trying to do is separate all the, all the vegetation from the fire itself so that it can't burn. Okay, so it'll back up against, it looks like a huge trail. Sometimes it looks like a, a, a four by four road that you can drive down, it's so big. And uh, so it's a very long day if you don't have a sharp Pulaski. Okay, that's why you always carry in your little 30-pound pack, you carry a lot of water, you carry some food because you may not get uh, food brought to you for a few days, and you always carry a file. And whenever you have a break, you get out your file and you start filing your Pulaski. So you can, um, so your work is effective and so you can, and, or otherwise you're just, um, you know, for every swing, uh, you, get, you get a lot less out of it. Okay, so it's a very good tool to have. Now, I quit... I decided I needed, uh, after three years of this, uh, to get a real job. So I worked for Exxon in Houston. And it wasn't the funnest real job I've ever had. Uh, meanwhile, my brother, he worked for a, a, a fire crew uh, known as the, the Sawtooth Hotshots. And you have to be pretty cocky to call yourself a hotshot. And that's what they were. This is, the, this is the most, um, one of the most respected fire crews in, in the whole West. Anytime they have a nasty job, uh, they call the Sawtooth Hotshots, and my brother went and worked with these guys, and he was young, and um, and these these fellows were the most uh, grizzled, uh, hardcore. They they ate nails for breakfast, um, kind of like Eric Willis, a very uh, a very um, a very hard uh, hard men, and beyond that, uh, beyond just the hard work, like uh, brother Eric Willis, um, well, they had some habits. They had some habits that. Uh, that some people think go along with being a man. Okay, they would, they would like to drink, they would like to smoke, and not too many of them uh, smoked, actually, in this crew. Um, and, and the relations with women were not, uh, were not something that we would be, um, that we would uh, consider um, righteous at all. To, uh, and that's understanding it quite a bit. And my brother worked with these folks, and he worked hard. In fact, he told me, I was, the reason I'm, I'm telling you about my brother is, um, is I look up to him quite a bit. He's a younger brother, uh, but I look up to him for, the, for some of the skills and the, and the attributes he has. And we were talking this weekend about this very fact. And he told me, he said, Lee, you know what? Uh, I didn't do this uh, for the money because the money's terrible. I did it to see if I could, you know, see if I could do it, see if I could develop uh, that kind of hard work. And so when he had a, a mid-year interview with the boss, the, the crew boss, they asked him, he, he thought he was going to get uh, critiqued on how how fast he could go, how many swings he could do an hour, if he could keep up with the rest of the crew if he was holding them back. And they didn't talk about that. They said, Joel, they said, we've watched you and we know that you stand up for your morals. We can see your character. And he never really thought about that. I mean, he'd always, of course, you know, uphold his morals. When they would drink, he would not. Um, and he would talk about the gospel when, when the opportunity arose. But he never thought he was, he was on display uh, uh, for his very character and how he treated other people and how, um, how, he, how he worked. And that, that was the essence, okay? That's what the essence, and that's what, that's what people notice. Um, and there was a great talk uh, given uh, last, last October by Bishop Richard e. Edgley, um, who's from my hometown in Centerville, Utah. And Bishop Edgley um, spoke and gave a talk called Behold the Man. And I don't know if anybody remembers this, but 
I think it's, it's very instructive on, on the, the characteristics and, and the things we knew to, to be a man. I was thinking about this, and, you know, uh, my friends will often uh, say, or you always hear, you know, Lee, you are the man. You are the man for coming here to do what you needed to do, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, for whatever favor I happened to do that. And so I thought, you know, what is, what is a... A real man, and and Bishop Ashley talks about that here, and he he has two criteria, and he says a true man is strong enough to withstand the wiles of Satan, and number two, a true man is humble enough to submit himself to the redemptive powers of the Savior. And he says this. He says, I suppose it is natural for us to equate strength. Uh, machoism, and perhaps even boisterous and aggressive behavior with manhood. However, the attributes of true manhood are not necessarily physical. And I'm grateful for this. Um, I enjoyed playing sports when I was young. Um, I had asthma. I had asthma very, very bad. I, I had to get taken to the hospital sometimes uh, uh, playing a soccer game. Um, and I don't think that held me back. I enjoyed sports throughout my, my high school career. But I'm, I'm glad that uh, the attributes of, of, of manhood don't involve uh, being phys physical. They're not always physical. Hard work is one thing, but uh, you don't have to um, be a lifelong athlete uh, uh, to achieve manhood. And there's a scripture, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about this. And it's in the, the book to the Ephesians. Now, I'm not sure um, who, who here, I know there's some good football players in the crowd, and I know there's some excellent students. I know there's some good basketball players. Uh, some of the... I need those big tabs on my scriptures from seminary. And so I know there's some good athletes. I don't know if there's any wrestlers here. Any wrestlers? Anybody wrestle? Some folks that look like they could wrestle, maybe that have wrestled uh, in the past. Past, I wrestled for one. Uh, I wrestled for one year, and didn't last too long in that sport. Um, but the Apostle Paul talks about this um, in in the chap in chapter six, verse twelve. He talks about wrestling. He says, "We but we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places." Um, so the, the things that we wrestle against uh, are, are, the, are the challenges of day-to-day of -day life. You know, for, for the youth here, it's, uh, it's uh, going to school. It's, uh, it's having friends that sometimes don't have the same standards that we do. Um, and my, I have uh, obviously four grandparents, and only one of those is a member, and she was inactive most of her life. Yeah. And now it's, it's very active. My grandpa, uh, the only grandpa I knew, uh, was not a member of the church. Um, and he, I remember going fishing with him, and he, he would always have his, uh, have, his, have his beer with him and have his other things, and never really approved of the church. But the one thing I knew about my grandfather, because all of his friends that were still alive would tell me, and all of my dad's friends would tell me, was that my grandfather was one of the most honest men that they knew. He had integrity, um, and that's something that um, it's nice if we, it gets noticed, and people do notice if you're honest with your fellow dealings with your with your um, with with your fellow men. If you're honest in your dealings with your fellow men, people notice. But if even if they don't notice, the integrity is one of the attributes of manhood that I think is the most important, because in the In the dark moments, in the moments that when you reflect on your own behavior, sometimes you're the only one that knows whether you've told the truth, whether you've cheated on a test, um, whether your, your preparations uh, have been sufficient. Um, and I guess I've uh, lived my whole life uh, wanting to do one thing uh, for my grandfather, and that's live up to his name. Uh, it's my grandfather Adams. And even in, um, hopefully be uh, a lot better than him in some things, 
I, I hope he will accept the gospel. But if I can live up to the integrity that my, that my grandfather have, has, um, I'll, be, I'll be very pleased with myself. Um, I, in the book of Job, we, we read um, of a man who goes through considerable trials. Okay? He has everything taken from him. Um, but he says one thing. Uh, he says, uh, till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me or my, on, my honesty. Because that might be the only thing uh, that you have left someday, is what you believe uh, in yourself. And so I, I have this written up, and I keep it on my wall. And every time I, I examine my own behavior, um, I, I remember this. I remember that uh, the integrity is the most important thing uh, that I have. And sometimes that's, that's difficult to be honest with yourself and to be honest with, uh, with our Heavenly Father. And sometimes, uh, sometimes we need to correct our behavior and we have uh, friends to do that. We have, um, we have lookouts. Uh, when I was, uh, that's one of the the Ten Commandments of, of firefight is you always have to have a lookout. Okay? Sometimes that was me, sometimes it was somebody else who would stand on the top of the hill and would see if the fire would hook, hook down beneath you and start burning up and you would have communications by radio and you would know that the fire is coming. You need lookouts. And, um, and we, have those, we have those in life too and that's our parents and it's often our bishop and our branch president. and. Um, we should uh, strive uh, to have them help us uh, maintain the honesty and the integrity of, of our souls. Um, just in closing, uh, I would like to, to read a scripture uh, from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 125, excuse me, 124. Uh, the... The prophet, uh, the prophet Joseph recorded a revelation, and he talks to specific people. And one of those he talks to is Hiram Smith, the, the, the brother of Joseph. And he says, again, verily I say unto you, blessed is my servant Hiram Smith, for I, the Lord, love him because of the integrity of his heart, and because he loveth that which is right before me. So how would it be to have the Lord, maybe, maybe people misinterpret you and think that, um, think that, uh, you know, think all sorts of things about you. Um, but you, if you have that personal integrity, that's what the Lord keys in on, and that's what the Lord will recognize. Um, and later on in the chapter, it even talks about uh, uh, some other of the servants uh, that worked with Joseph Smith and their integrity. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, <laughs> I guess it's just the brothers today. Um, I hope that you'll, uh, in your dealings, uh, at school and with people you work with and in the dealings with other young women that you maintain the integrity and maintain honesty. Um, it's been it's, uh, it's been a blessing to me uh, at the time at times of my life when, when I know that's that's all um, that, that my actions are in accordance with uh, with the gospel and that I'm being honest in all things. Um, I have a testimony of, of Jesus Christ uh, the great master and and the man that he is, and the God that he is. And I bear that testimony, and I say it in the name of uh, the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. At University of Texas in Austin, there is a basketball player named Gabe Moneke. <clears throat> Gabe is from Nigeria. He's about six foot eight, and he's about 250 pounds. Gabe, during his junior year, was playing in basketball games that were on national TV. And his opponent was kind of shoving him a little bit. And Gabe actually, on two different occasions, hit someone in the face on national TV. And uh, th so this happens on national TV. The cameras catch it, and then it shows up on Sports Center at night. And so you see, this, you see this, this really strong guy hitting. Two different times, somebody right in the face. The basketball world is really small. And so all of us basketball players, we, we hear about this, we see it on TV, and, and we look at that guy and we just think to ourselves, that guy is crazy. That's, that's what I thought when I, when I kind of was exposed to Gabe. After these incidents, he was 
he was told that he needed to see an anger counselor. So he went one time, and he thought I wasn't worth it, so he never went back. So up until about a month ago, Gabe was always just kind of someone in my mind that I knew existed, and that was all. Then a month ago, I was invited to attend kind of an NBA pre-draft camp. So I walked into the hotel where all the players were staying, and sitting in the lobby, I saw, I saw Gabe on a, on a couch. <laughs> and uh, I, in my mind, I'm just thinking to myself, okay, I'm ready. It looks like I'll be playing against Gabe this week. <laughs> and I thought to myself, it's time to start acting tough. <laughs> So I kind of got a, a mean look on my face, or I kind of got a tough look on my face, and I, I had to walk by him to get to the front desk. <laughs> so I got a tough look on my face, and I said, Gabe, okay, how you doing? <laughs> Put out my hand, we shook hands. I walked, to, I, walked to the, uh, I walked to the attendant at the lobby desk. I thought to myself, okay, that's probably the only interaction I'll have with Gabe. And so I was handed my key to my room, and I said, by the way, who's my roommate? And the lady said, your roommate is Gabe Moneke. <laughs> and so I looked, I looked at the lady and I said, um, there must be a mistake. <laughs> I don't think I'm supposed to be Gabe's roommate. She said, you're Gabe's roommate. And so uh, I went up to the room. He wasn't there. We had different practice schedules. But after my first practice, I went, I went up to the room and Gabe was in the room. And so things were tense for a few minutes. Um, I knew kind of what he was all about. and and. And he, you know, he didn't talk a whole lot to me. It was, getting to know Gabe was very, very interesting. The first night we kind of just talked a little bit about our schools, not very much. I noticed the next morning at 7.30 in the morning, Gabe just woke up at about seven o'clock. I, I, kinda, I kinda noticed the light turn on and Gabe started to read the Bible at, at, at seven in the morning. I was sitting there asleep, <laughs> just relaxing. <laughs> Gabe, Gabe, every morning, got up and read the Bible. And we really got to, during that week, we started to talk a lot about different things. Um, we talked a lot about, about Jesus Christ. He, to come to find out, Gabe is an extremely religious person. He told me some things that I, that I thought were, were, were excellent. He said, you know what, I've made a lot of mistakes. He says, I, I've made some mistakes in my life. And he said, I've really tried to learn from them. And, uh, the more I got to know Gabe, the more I found that he was just a very likable, a very happy person. We, we played different schedules at night. One night I played an early game, and then Gabe played a late game. So I played my early game, and I came back, and I got in bed. It was about 8 o'clock. Gabe came back from his game at 9.30, and he told me that he had won the game, and that their team had won, and he said that he was going to Chili's to get some food. And he asked me if I wanted anything, and... and um, I told him something small. He brought me back an egg roll. So I ate the egg rolls really good. So, <laughs> so the next night, we played each other, and we were both the late game. And so we got back to our room, we showered, and he said, and we decided we were going to both go to Chili's to get something to eat. So we, we went out of our hotel that was in downtown Phoenix, actually downtown Tempe, where, where the combine was being held, and we walked down the main street of town. And it was Gabe and I, and, and I was kind of walking a little bit in front because it was pretty tight. And there was this woman who was about 60 years old. Um, it was clear that she was on drugs, that um, alcoholic. She was begging for money. And it, in my mind, I saw this woman, and I said to myself, there's no way I'm giving this woman money at all. And so I just kept kind of walking. And then I turned behind me to, to see, and then I noticed Gabe wasn't with me. And I turned behind me, and Gabe was talking to this woman. I thought to myself, Gabe, Look, I know you're trying to, in my mind, I'm thinking, Gabe, you're trying to be a good guy, but you're going to give her money, and she's just going to spend it on drugs or alcohol. So I just kind of went back to, to talk to Gabe, and, and, and here's what Gabe was saying to this woman. Gabe said, hey, how you doing? He said, um, you want me to bring you the same things I brought you last night? Um, a, hot, a hot drink, a few egg rolls, some rice. That's what he was saying to this woman. Um, and, and that just, it, it was amazing for me to see because here was a guy who, who really was just going outside of his comfort zone to influence the life of someone else. Um, Gabe is a man, and I want to tell you why. Gabe had made a lot of decisions in his life, and there was a time when he was not living the law of chastity. There was a time, in fact, when he was, when he was um, doing all kinds of things 
that, that go very much in contrary to the gospel, with women specifically. And, and the, as we talked more and as we got to know each other more, he told me that, that um, a number of months ago, he had made a decision to keep the law of chastity. And I was so impressed with that. Here's a guy who had, had made a lot of mistakes, including he had broken the law of chastity, and, and he had made a decision. He had said, you know what? It's happened, now I'm gonna move on, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the law of chastity. When I was asked to give a talk on what it means to be a man, I sincerely believe that a man will repent and make changes in his life when necessary. I wanna just open the scriptures. You don't need to open your scriptures. I'll just read straight out of the book of Isaiah. There's a scripture that talks about repentance. And this is the Lord speaking, Jesus Christ, and he says, he says, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And, and this is the scripture that I just love, and I think it applies to every one of us. It says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Um, a year and a half ago, David Benyon, who, who attends Stanford and who I'm a classmate with, gave a talk on the atonement. And he said, you know, in the church, when we talk about repentance, when someone talks about repentance, oftentimes we look at that person and we judge them. And we say, that person has to repent. They've done something bad. But what Dave said, Dave said, in reality, when someone repents, the heavens rejoice. The heavens rejoice. And, and the fact that people are putting into action the atonement of Christ Jesus Christ rejoices, and he's happy because he's the one who, who paid such a dear price to make the atonement work. To go to another scripture along these same lines, Jesus Christ continues to speak in Isaiah 43 about the atonement, and he says, I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions. He'll erase our transgressions. When it says blot out, I didn't quite understand what that meant. It, it means to erase. It says, he'll erase thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. In the very next chapter, it says, talking about those who have repented, it says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. This is verse 22. And as a cloud thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. When I study, the more I study the atonement, the, the more my testimony of Christ grows, and, and I, I become more and more thankful to him for his atonement. I also believe that, that a man, a man of the Lord, will trust and have faith in Heavenly Father. I want to share a story from my mission. I had the, I had the great privilege of serving a mission uh, when I was 19 years old. And when I was on my mission, there was one elder who was just really smiley. He was just very active. He would talk to everyone on the streets. He would go knocking thousands of doors. He, he just seemed never to tire. So, you know, missionaries sometimes like to have fun. In Spain, elevators are kind of built differently than here. Elevators in Spain have no closing, have no closing door on them. So you get into the elevator, and you go up, and you just, because there's no closing door, you just kind of see the wall, and the wall kind of moves as you go, it looks like the wall's moving as you go up. So Elder Fredrickson was at the top of the building and he was in the elevator going down. And the elevators are small. So he was kind of, just to have fun, he kind of put his back up against the wall of the elevator and he had a rubber shoe. And he was kind of just putting his foot up on the, on the wall as it went, as the elevator was going down so it looked like the wall was going up. Well his foot with the rubber sole got jammed on the wall and it just snapped his knee, it just totally snapped his knee. And, uh, sorry, sorry to bring that up, but uh, snapped his knee. Well, he was sent to the mission, the mission office. And in the mission office, the mission president, I guess, called the MTC in Provo and said, we've got this missionary that has a broken knee in three places. You know, what should we do? And they said, send him home. Send the missionary home. He shouldn't be out in the field. So the mission, the mission president went back to Elder Fredrickson and said, they've told me to send you home. And Elder Fredrickson loved being on his mission so much, and he, he valued so much the opportunity to serve the Lord, that he just said, no, I'm staying here, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a missionary. I, I don't care what it takes. 
I'm going to serve my mission. And the mission president said, no, they've told me to send you home. And Elder Ferrickson said, no. <laughs> and so they put him on crutches, and, and, and he, he walked around on crutches in the mission home just reading books. He couldn't go out and proselyte, so he would just read the scriptures all day long. And his knee got better extremely quickly, and after about a month and a half, he was back out in the field. And he was a tremendous missionary throughout the rest of his entire mission. A missionary filled with faith, a missionary that trusted in the Lord. I want to share a scripture um, from the book of Alma that I think really, that really hits home with me and that I think really can be applied to Elder Fredrickson. It's found in Alma, as uh, Alma, the, Alma gives counsel to his sons. This specific is found in specifically Alma 36, verse 3. And again, this, this is Alma speaking to his son Helaman. And he says, And now, O my son Helaman, behold, thou art in thy youth, and therefore I beseech of thee that thou wilt hear my words and learn of me. For I do know that whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials and their troubles and their afflictions and shall be lifted up at the last day. And then jumping ahead to Alma 38.5, this one I love. This is, this is Alma to his son Shiblon. He says, As much as ye shall put your trust in God, even so much ye shall be delivered out of your trials and your troubles and your afflictions, and ye shall be lifted up at the last day. Finally, I believe that, that real men are not afraid to stand up and walk away from a situation that is compromising. In every one of our lives, we're faced with conversations, with circumstances, with many temptations that priesthood holders should recognize, stand up, and walk away from. And I, I firmly believe that, that true men, when they walk away, are heroes in the, in the sight of Heavenly Father. It's true. If we're in a group and we, and we walk away from something, we might be called a wimp. We might be called a prude. But I believe that we, are, we will be heroes in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. To conclude, I want to just share a personal experience um, kind of about my own, my own striving to become more of a man. And this is something that, uh, that I haven't really shared much. And this is something that I that I felt like I want to share with, with the brethren of the church. Um, and it, it has to do with the relationship that I had with my coach at Stanford, Coach Montgomery. And I'll just go ahead and be very honest uh, with the experience and, and, and share with you, kind of just open up my heart and, and share this because I think it, um, I, I just think it, it, uh, it definitely was a meaningful experience in my life. We played against a team called Connecticut a year and a half ago at Maples Pavilion. We lost the game. We ended up losing the game. I ended up playing a lot of the game, and we had the chance to win if, if, if our players would have made free throws. Um, my own free throw shooting for that night, I made two free throws out of eight. And so I missed a bunch of free throws. I was breaking free throws left and right. Um, it got to the point where the other team would just foul me to send me the free throw line. Well, I felt horrible after we lost, and the next day, I went in to talk to Coach Montgomery about how I can improve my free throw shooting. I walked into the basketball office on the second floor, and I walked in and I could hear Coach Montgomery talking on the telephone, but he couldn't see me. His office door was open, but he couldn't see that I had walked in. But everyone else in the office saw that I had walked in. Everyone said, the secretary said, hi, Mark. I said, hey, what's up? The other coaches said, hello. I, I said, hi, and I just sat down to wait for Coach Montgomery to finish with his phone call. Well, I, he was talking really loud on the phone. I could hear what, what he was saying. And so I, he I heard him say on the phone, I heard him say, yeah, we lost the game. Every time we gave the ball to Matson, he threw it away or he, he wouldn't convert. He just played a really bad game. And uh, I, got, I got really upset. I stood up and I walked out. I stood up and I just walked out. And from that point, really for, for a lot of coming months, I was, very, I was, I was upset at coach. I, I had some bitterness towards him. Um, I felt like everything that he was saying to me after that point was a personal attack on me. It, it got to the point where the season ended, 
a lot of seniors graduated, and Coach Montgomery started talking about developing leadership for the next year. And in the meetings, he would say, you know, we, have, we, we don't have much leadership on this team. And, and I was, was going to be one of the seniors that was supposedly supposed to be a leader. And, and he would say, you know, we really need to develop the leadership. We've got, you know, we have, we have okay guys, but we've got to improve it. Anytime he would make a comment like this, I, I felt personally attacked, which, which, was, which was wrong of me. And so I, I, let this, I let this fester inside of me for months. I let it fester. I, I believe what, what a man would have done is immediately approach coach and worked out the difference. But I let it fester inside of me for months. And, and finally, I went home for the summer and I, I kind of just let it, I let it go. I let the whole thing go. I came back to school the next season, and, and Coach and I had a good relationship. And then something very interesting happened. Um, I attended a baptism, baptismal service of Sterling Hancock, who is the son of Bishop Hancock in the Stanford Ward. And uh, the spirit was very strong that day. And during the baptism, I, 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 felt, I really felt the Holy Ghost. I felt something very powerfully say to me, not, not in words, but just in, in a feeling that I felt said, go to coach and resolve the difference. That's what I felt inside of me. And I, I had practice a few hours later that day. And I felt it so strongly, I thought to myself, I'm going to do it. When practice is over, I'm going to go to coach. I'm going to tell him that I harbored feelings against him, that um, I'm going to apologize to him. That's what I decided I was going to do. So practice came, and we started practice, and I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going to do that. Coach will think I'm a wimp. He'll think I'm crazy. There's no way I'm going to do that. And so practice ended, and, and I, I decided I wasn't going to do it. And so we were shooting free throws, and, and, uh, and, and brethren, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, just, just and again, it wasn't a, like I heard a voice. It wasn't, it wasn't like a lightning bolt. I just felt something inside of me that said, you need to talk to coach. You need to resolve this right now. You've been hurting yourself for all this time. It's time that you, you put this behind you. And so I just, I just decided I'm going to do it. And so I went right over to coach. And I said, coach, I need to talk to you. And so we went to a, we went to a corner in, in, in Maples Pavilion. And, and I just, I told him everything I've told you. And I apologized to him for having harbored those feelings and for having, not, for having felt attacked. And, you know, co what coach, Mon coach Montgomery thanked me. He said, you know, like, thanks for telling me this. He said, you need to learn how to communicate a little better. He said, when you get married, <laughs> you, you better learn how to communicate with your wife. Otherwise, you're both going to have war chests stored up for years, and then one day it's going to explode, and you're going to have a big fight. <laughs> but uh, I, just, I just felt like I really wanted to share that today. I think that, I think that in our relationships with, with other human beings, we can, always, we can always find something wrong with someone else. We can always allow bitterness to enter in. But I really believe that the true man of Christ in his relationships with other men, with other women, will have the utmost honor and integrity. And uh, I just want to conclude with my testimony that I, I'm so thankful for the Book of Mormon. I have a testimony of the Book of Mormon. When I read it, and when I really try to read it, and when I try to read it sincerely, I, I feel the Spirit. When I pick it up and I just kind of thumb through a page and I just kind of read it, when I'm half asleep, I, I don't feel much. But when I sit down and when I really try to read the Book of Mormon, I feel the Spirit. And, and that really was the beginning of my testimony. And I try, to, I try to read the Scripture sincerely to try to strengthen my testimony. Um, I know that Christ lives, and I'm so thankful for his atonement in my own life. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm very happy to be with you this evening. The last time we met in such occasion as this, we, it was in a stake priesthood meeting, so I think many of you were here, and we talked about the process by which a boy becomes a man and how we as Melchizedek priesthood holders and fathers have a very important role in helping our sons and our friends' sons and those men in our stake and in our ward who were in the process of becoming men. 
I've listened carefully to what uh, Lee Adams has said and Mark Madsen tonight, and I think you would agree with me that the common theme that they have both expressed is that of courage. It takes courage to fight a forest fire. It takes more courage, I believe, to, as Lee described his brother, for a young man to be able to stay true to his morals and principles uh, and, to, and to obey the law of chastity in the face of the temptation that that creates sometimes. It takes courage to say that we're sorry. It takes courage to go to the Lord and ask His forgiveness and change the things we do that are wrong and to seek through Him the atonement of Jesus Christ so that we might be made clean from our sins. I have the opportunity this time of year especially, to interview all young men who are planning to go on missions, and young women as well. And there's not an interview that I finish where I don't think, my goodness, what a strong, powerful, courageous young person I've just interviewed. Those of us who are older are not unaware of the difficulties that, it, that a young man encounters these days uh, on the process to reaching the age for missionary work. There's many temptations. There's temptations to compromise the world of, word of wisdom. There's temptation to compromise the law of chastity. There's temptations to compromise our language and to use foul and bad language. There's temptations to tell dirty stories. There's temptations to participate uh, and to view unwholesome magazines or uh, movies or the internet. There are temptations all around you. We're aware of that. And it's interesting to me how many young people are able to, with the help of their family, with the help of their advisors, with the help of the other Melchizedek priesthood, certainly their mothers, the women in their life, their bishops, how many young men are able to go through this process and to not be wounded by it so that they are unable or un un unwilling to qualify to serve a mission. I hope that you young men that are here tonight will set forth a goal of going on a mission. If you will do that, you will have a concrete goal that you can work towards every day and every time you have a difficult decision to make, every time your friends or an associates or the people you hang around with at school want to take you in the wrong way, if you'll remember, someday I'm going to stand before my bishop and my stake president, and I'm going to be interviewed. And I don't want there to be problems of such a degree that I will not be able to go on a mission. That's a very specific goal that you can think about every day, you can plan towards. And if you will do that, it will lead you through this difficult time in your life with all these challenges that surround you. And you will find that for you to resist these temptations for, and for you to stay on, stay on the straight and narrow path, it will require great courage. I, uh, I have known friends that have been firefighters, and I have friends that are basketball players. I've known Mark. Uh, let me tell you a story about Mark. It's a, a very recent story that I think tells you a little bit about him. 
When I think of Mark Madsen, <clears throat> I don't really think of a basketball player. I think Mark even knows that. I don't relate to Mark as a basketball player. I'm, I'm glad he has that talent. It's a wonderful talent. But I don't, I don't relate to him that way. I relate to him as a man of courage. I relate to Lee the same way. Uh, a few months ago, just after I came home from the hospital, I was feeling very sick. I was, it was late at night, not too late at night. It was about 11 o'clock, I guess. I had a bed downstairs because I couldn't climb upstairs, and I was recuperating from my operation. My wife had uh, gone upstairs, and I was alone, and I was uh, just getting ready to go to bed, and I heard a knock on the door. And it was late, and I was tired, and I didn't really want to get up because I was sore and it hurt when I got up. And uh, the knock persisted. In fact, it got louder. And I thought, well, someone wants to get in this house pretty badly. Someone wants me pretty badly. And so I put on my robe and, and walked to the door and turned on the light. And there was Mark and uh, a young lady who was with him at that time. And he presented to me a loaf of bread that he had baked for me. And I had a hard time getting the two of them in the house, but I finally talked them into coming in, and I thanked them. And then after they left, I was very hungry, and I went in and I cut a slice of Mark's bread, and it was delicious. I toasted it and put jam and butter and jam on it, and I had a, I had a great feast. And I thought, you know, Mark has a lot of things on his mind. He's a, he's a dedicated student. He, it's hard to get a, to graduate from Stanford. It takes a lot, of, a lot of courage to go through Stanford. He has this basketball thing that he's working with. It was right in the middle of his season. But he had taken the time to think of me and to deliver some bread. Now, that happened to me many, many times during this whole situation. So in different ways. But I wanted you to know that about Mark, that whenever I think of Mark in the future, I'm always going to be glad that I was able to see him play basketball and that I was able to know him during this period of time in his life. But I'm always going to think about that night. I'm always going to think about that knock at the door. I'm going to think about his, his willingness to, I'm sure, put other things that were very important to him second that night and put that loaf of bread first and coming to my house. That is the church we belong to. That is the God that we follow. Those are the teachings of Jesus Christ that are ours and that we have the privilege of trying to abide by. To be a member of the church requires courage. I could talk to Mark about this at some time, but uh, I think he might agree with me that it takes far more courage to keep the law of chastity, to, to say no to other kinds of temptations than it does to be a great basketball player. I think it takes as much work, as much persistence, and more courage. I think that to be a righteous member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for a young man requires more courage than anything you could do in the athletic field. That's just my own opinion. Some people may feel differently, but that's, that's my opinion. I, uh, when I think of courage and when I think of examples of courage, I always have to turn to the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament and remind my myself of the story of David. I'm not going to read the whole account today, but I want you to remember that uh, David's people were fighting a, a, a very strong army. Uh, the, the people they were fighting were the Philistines. The Israelites were, fought, were fighting the Philistines. And the Philistines had a, a champion. It was, it, it was not unusual in those days to have, rather than to have all the armies fight, each side would pick their own champion 
and then they would fight it out, and whoever won, won the battle, and, and then it was uh, settled until next time. Well, uh, this Philistine was a very large man and had a reputation for being very strong, and uh, everyone was just afraid to death of him. And no one wanted to go up against him, and he would come out and he would challenge them and he would yell at them and call them cowards and dogs. Uh, to try and, and uh, uh, get some response out of them, but people were afraid. And uh, David was just a boy. Uh, he was the same age as, uh, or younger than, than most of you here. I'm not exactly sure what it was. Maybe some of you remember it. I think he was about 14 or 15, something like that. He was a shepherd. He had an... He, uh, one of the shepherds' jobs in those times was to protect their flocks against wild animals, and so he knew how to use a sling, and I'm sure he had a lot of practice of it. And so he came into camp his, uh, not knowing what was going on, and he, he viewed this situation. <clears throat> now, all the, all the people around him were, were grown men, and they were, you know, mighty warriors, and they had their spears, and they had their shields, and they had their, their protection, and, they were, and their swords, and everything. And this young boy walked up with no armor, uh, and saw what was going on, and, and, and wanted to know, why is this happening? Why, why are you allowing this one man, this giant of a man, I know he's a giant, but why are you allowing him to, uh, to, 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 to to force all of you to surrender. Where, where's your courage? He might have asked. Where's your courage? And he said when he came onto the battlefield, he said, uh, uh, Saul was the king, and he said, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, speaking of the bad guy, let no man's heart fail because of him, thy servant, speaking of himself, Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine, this 14-year-old boy. See, he had courage. He had moral courage. He had moral courage. And then when we read, read a little bit further on, we understand the source of his courage. And I just want to read two or three verses to you because the king, if you recall, said, okay, well, you'll, you can fight for us, but here, let me, let me have you put on my armor. And he tried that out, and he said, no, it's too heavy. It's not my size. I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight with any armor. He said, well, let me have, let you use my sword or my spear. No, he says, I don't want to do that. He said, I've, I have a sling here, and I've, out, and out guarding the flock, I've killed bear, and I've killed lion with a sling. I've faced, as a young man, I've, I, I've had to be uh, exercise courage. And uh, so I'm not afraid of this man. And so anyway, so this, so here's this great big giant of a man out there, all armed and with his huge sword and his spear and everything, and he's yelling at the Israelites and taunting them, and, and suddenly out comes this 14-year-old boy. And, uh, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. That means he, he put him down. And, and he, he, he thought, this is, a, this is an idiot. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. Didn't have his beard yet, see? He was fair, soft-skinned, just, just a youth. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? that thou comest to me with staves, that means sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He was offended and angry that they would send out a little boy. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. In other words, I'm going to tear you apart. Literally. Now here's the source of David's courage, and here has to be the source of our courage. This is what will get all of us through. Specifically, we're talking about young men. This will what this will be what will get you through this challenging time. 
Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. And he, now David was upset. This day will the Lord deliver thee unto mine, into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air, and so in other words, he just said, well, you said you're going to do that to me, well, that's what I'm going to do to you. And then, of course, he went ahead and did it. Courage. Courage. The courage of a 14-year-old boy was able to slay that giant. The courage of a 14-year-old boy can withstand the temptations and the wiles of Satan and can stand up to, to temptation and to say no. And those of us who are Melchizedek priesthood holders here tonight have the responsibility of helping our young men do that. We have here young men's advisors, we have bishops, we have fathers. All of us have this responsibility to help our young men develop what has been defined tonight by Lee and Mark as a true definition of manhood. True men are pure. True pure men are good. Pure men and good men bring loaves of bread to people when they're sick. They think about them. They're interested in education. They understand the importance of it. Their parents understand that as well. They assist them in that process. We have been given, in this stake and every other stake in the church, we have been given the responsibility, all of us, not just the stake president, to build the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is strong. It's good, but it's strong, and it's courageous, and it can't be knocked down, and it can't be it can't be turned aside. I invite all of us to participate in the process of building the kingdom of God, building the kingdom of God in our own lives through the exercise of courage, building the kingdom of God in our own families by living in accordance with the family proclamation and the principles of the gospel, building the, pro building the kingdom of God in our wards and in our stake. Let me just end by telling you that tonight, this afternoon, I wrote my final letter to my youngest son while he's on his mission. I number the letters because it sort of helps me keep track of how long my missionaries and my family are gone. Tonight I wrote him my 94th letter. I've got a stack of them, they're that high. In the letter I told him how much I appreciated his example to his father. I said, you, you've been getting a wonderful experience. You've had your, your, your testimony built, you have had to exercise courage. You've been, you've been blessed by serving a mission. But I want you to know that because I am your father and because I trust you as you trust me, that when you tell me, when you bear your testimony to me, when you tell me of your experiences with the Lord, when you tell me how he has guided and direct you, directed you, 
my testimony has been built too. I have been strengthened. You are my son. But you've been teaching me these last two years. I said, how are we able to do that? I, I didn't sit down thinking about it. I just started to type. Mm -hmm. And all this came out. And I realized it was because this mutual trust that we had with each other that had been developed during the process of me raising him as a boy and him reacting to his father until now there is total trust between us. He knows he can rely on me. I know I can rely on him. I pray that I think in that process if we can develop fathers to sons and sons to father this iron clad trust and confidence in each other that no matter what challenges face you as young men or as fathers that they can be overcome and I pray that we might have the Spirit of the Lord to be with us as we seek to build the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ Amen